So we have three speakers from Norton. Carly is um, a media and literature, or, sorry, literature and film editor at Norton, and um, Evan and Mateus are co-directors of the Norton Lab, and they have some really exciting stuff to share about annotations and the implications for publishing and education. Thanks, Michelle. I'm, I have two microphones. I'm going to speak into one of them. Um, so thank you for having us. Um, so kind of a show of hands. Does anyone here know what Norton is that we're not? Yes, we're a publishing company, not an antivirus company. Um, <laughs> uh, we um, are an independent and employee-owned publishing house, and we've been around since 1923. This is our logo. Um, we publish in lots of different areas, from cookbooks to astronomy textbooks. Um, but what we're perhaps best known for are the Norton anthologies, and I'm probably the only person who brought a heavy book as a presentation tool um, at this conference. But the first Norton Anthology was published in 1962, and this is actually our first edition that published in that year. Oh, thanks. Sorry. There we go. Um, it was really unique for being a course in a book, so it brought together all of the works of English literature that you might teach in a survey course from the Middle Ages to the modern era. But it, what it really did that was that made it innovative was its approach to annotation. This is um, actually a page from the first edition, and it shows um, how the annotations appear kind of at the bottom of the page and in the marginal gloss. So this is the first time that literary texts were annotated specifically with a college student in mind. They were right on the page, which made um, it easy for them to reference in the footer and in the margin, not grouped at the end. Um, as endnotes, as they traditionally had been, where you would need to flip back and forth. Uh, they were authored by college classroom teachers to be specifically um, explanatory, but not interpretive. So this is that instructors wouldn't have to spend time in class explaining uh, references to Greek mythology or defining Middle English terms. It would free up class time for the meteor work of literary interpretation. And because the footnotes are not interpretive, students could come up with their own ideas and inter interpret, learn to interpret literary texts on their own um, and kind of do that real work of the English major. So we've been thinking for decades about what makes a high quality, pedagogically useful student annotation. And we have large teams of professor authors trained in the creation of these annotations. Many of the works in the Norton Anthology are in the public domain, so these annotations are a huge part of the value that the Norton Anthologies have offered um, to college students for decades. Now, the next layer of annotation in a Norton Anthology um, is the annotations that the students make themselves. And I have a few examples here that I can show. We actually... Um, Students actually send us these all the time through our social media accounts to be like, look at how loved my Norton Anthology was and how much I annotated it. Um, I like this one because it has tea spilled all over it. Um, <laughs> this one is maybe my favorite. Um, <laughs> so every literature teacher and professor encourages, can you see it? Yeah. Encourages their students uh, to highlight, mark, and make notes on a text as they read uh, to identify p potentially significant elements in the text. This is an essential part of the close reading process for an English student. This is where students start incubating those original ideas that they might later discuss in class or use in a paper. They also mark up poems using a process called scansion. Um, and I don't know, those of you who have taken a poetry course, um, but scansion is a way that um, someone studying poetry marks stressed and unstressed syllables to determine the meter of a poem. So here we have a Shakespeare example that is unique because it is in iambic tetrameter, not an iambic pentameter, um, which was something you might want to study in class. Uh, we hear from people all the time that they keep their Norton anthologies from college forever because they can't bear to part with the work they put into them and they want to go back and reference them. So what do we want to talk about, sorry, what we want to talk about is how this history as annotators translates into the digital world. What does a Norton Anthology annotation look like on the web? Uh, both publisher provided annotations like our footnotes, but also the ones that students add themselves. Um, a few years ago, we started thinking about offering the Norton Anthologies as eBooks for the first time. Um, and 
our first big foray into that was with the Norton Shakespeare, which is one of our biggest titles, um, both in importance to our business and in size at 3,536 pages. Uh, we felt really strongly about offering a user experience that was as good as the print product we had offered for over 50 years, and annotation was a huge part of that. So the big question was how best to translate our footnotes and marginal glosses from the print to an ebook design that does not have a footer. And also thinking about what other ways we can be annotators and encourage annotation in, in our digital presence. Um, and so now I'm going to pass it over to Mateus, who really knows the most about how we actually tackled doing that. Thank you, Carly. Uh, so as Carly talked about, there are several uh, layers of annotation that um, can be applied to Norton titles. I'm actually going to start talking about uh, these different layers as different use cases. Uh, so I'll go through a few different examples. but. Um, here we have two examples of uh, annotations in our ebooks. Uh, the one on, on top is for the Norton Digital Anthologies, and the one on the bottom is for uh, an upcoming product, which is the Norton Chaucer. Uh, but you can already see that there are a few different things going on on these pages. So we have print folios, which correspond to the different uh, editions of the Norton Anthology. So the anthologies are not just published as single monolithic texts. They are also split for uh, convenience of the student in several volumes. Um, there are additional annotations on those annotations to show which volume splits these different pagination schemes correspond to. Uh, there are audio annotations, uh, and this is true for the anthologies in the Norton Shakespeare, where we have spoken audio that corresponds to the text that you're seeing on the page. There are tooltips, and in the ebook, these replace things like marginal glosses. So, if there is a word in Middle English that's in the margin defined in Modern English, then that might be made into a tooltip in line. Uh, those replace footnotes as well, uh, anything that shows up on the bottom of the print page, and then in some cases, even endnotes. And then, of course, line numbers uh, are important reference. Uh, and those aren't really traditionally annotations, but those are marginal items that appear on the page that are kind of secondary to the narrative. Um, and that could be done with an annotation, uh, in an annotation data model. Um, so this is how the, the digital anthologies kind of became after we went through the entire process of production. And before I go to that, I do want to talk about a few other examples because like Carly was saying, Norton does not just publish the anthologies, we publish a wide variety of texts. Um, so if I go uh, and start showing you uh, different things that we can do on our books, uh, we can have, uh, again here, a tooltip with a definition in line, we have user highlighting, uh, we have marginal callouts, we have a user annotation that was added with our own annotation tool. We have an instructor annotation that's only visible to the instructor uh, and, and the instructor's class. Um, and then we also have things in other disciplines. So this is a, a screenshot of a composition book. And we have these notes that correspond through symbols and colors uh, to different parts of the text. And then in addition to that, these different tags have tooltips that are annotated in line. Uh, that would probably be a footnote or a glossary definition. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, annotated examples. So in a composition book, how do you uh, reference a website or, uh, yeah, a website or how do you translate that into a citation? Uh, you also have things like example student papers in our composition textbooks. You have annotated music. Uh, you have things like annotated uh, like this aria, which you can also make an interactive annotation from. This is an, a piece of audio that has annotation throughout, and then as the audio plays and you hit them, uh, the, these different landmarks, these annotations show up on the bottom. Uh, you can have annotated images in a biochemistry book. 
You can have annotated, annotation flags that are pedagogical in a sociology book to mark where a part that's relevant to the MCAT falls. You can have different regions in an image that are annotated, and then you can have feedback based on assessment that are annotations on that particular region of the image. And then in this case, Evan's actually going to talk about this example later, but this is a, an interactive transcript for a sociology video. Uh, and then the transcript below corresponds to the uh, timestamp in the video above. And then here we have an interactive uh, scansion, a system for uh, students to actually annotate a piece of poetry by adding scansion marks to the text. And then we also have things like metadata that can also be uh, part of uh, an annotation like citation information. Uh, in this case, this is from the newest edition of the Norton Anthology of American Literature uh, ebook where you can actually go page by page and we've manually tagged that metadata in each page so that a student can click a single button and get citation information for that passage or for that, for that selection. Uh, so there's quite a lot here. Uh, and especially in this uh, case, it's important uh, to keep in mind that publishing, certain publishing restrictions can affect how it is that we allow people to annotate our texts. So citation information, for example, if a student wants to extract their annotations from our platform, can they take parts of that text? We might be bound by a permission agreement to another publisher that says we can't take that information, but we can give them citation information. Um, so as we're talking about this, um, I'm actually going to circle back to this screen on the anthologies and explain how it is that we got there from the print book. Um, so we actually start with a project editorial process, uh, which is very similar to the print process. We're doing manual markup of uh, print uh, proofs, so PDFs. Uh, they get scanned by hand, and every element that has to be translated in a certain way in the ebook gets marked up. Uh, and I have an example of that too. Um, this is from the Norton Anthology from when we were doing a, the digital anthologies. This is an example of an annotated page. Uh, just say, for example, uh, split footnote nine into two tooltips because they have to appear in two different locations. Uh, the highlighted items might be glosses that will turn into tooltips in the ebook. And this has to be repeated for I think upwards of 20,000 pages, and it's done by hand. Uh, so it's an immense amount of work. Uh, and there's no real uh, common tool or system that lets us do this uh, in a single workflow. So this is being done by separate teams, and then as it gets uh, turned over from team to team, each team has to translate it into their own method of doing work. So when this gets turned over to the ebook department, we actually have to find a way to work with the vendor and communicate this in technical terms, uh, which is not a very trivial process, and it can actually introduce a lot of errors. Um, so the other thing uh, that can actually be a con here uh, is how much paper it takes. So this is uh, an example. Carly standing next to uh, what looks like proofs from the Norton Anthologies. This actually came out of the print editorial process, but in the same process that all of these proofs are being marked up with corrections, for example, or feedback from the author and the editors, um, it's the same thing that we're doing to, in the conversion to digital. Uh, we just don't have a stack of paper because we're doing PDFs, but it's a very similar uh, amount of work, if that can help you visualize it. Um, so that's one con, of course, but um, we also have the issue that there is no uniform interface uh, to produce these different implementations. We just saw maybe a dozen examples of different use cases for annotations in our texts, but there's no common production language uh, to talk about this. Um, and in addition to that, the user experience between the person actually marking up the text and then the, the customer using the, at the other end of the, the process, using the product and accessing this, these annotations is very, very different. Uh, and they use vastly different tools to access that information too. Um, so that creates a gap in understanding between the people creating the product and the people consuming the product. Um, not only that, but it creates problems internally as well, because each different implementation in these examples that I showed you 
have a different solution uh, to actually make them digital. They have different markup, uh, which means different content tagging. Uh, they use different JavaScript libraries to actually display to the user and produce a user experience. And they can sometimes even have different versions of the same libraries because certain features aren't available in like version 2.1 of uh, tipped, for example, tipped.js. Um, so because of that, there's no common data model. There's no way to really easily decouple annotations from the main content itself. And that's something that we would want to do in order to make the process more flexible, make the content more repurposable, and therefore make our business model a little more sustainable. Uh, and also, uh, what that adds is maintainability, so that if we want to make a new addition, we don't have to do this work all over again. We can easily just port the annotation information from one book to another. Uh, so we've done a few things to try to fix that, um, and Evan will talk about that in detail. Uh, but for the past uh, two to three years, we've I, I've been collaborating with Evan. I was the head of our ebook department for uh, three years, and as I was working on these things, I there were a lot of problems that were showing up, and I knew that they could be addressed in a, a creative way. And Evan, uh, at the time, who was our accessibility special, specialist, also had concerns about how the content was being tagged. Um, so. Together, we kind of came up with a new model to do things um, that includes automated content parsing and tagging, decoupling the annotation content from the narrative content of, of the book so that they can be reused, um, and then also looking at things like the web annotation data model to uh, uh, cover a lot of these different use cases. Um, so I'll let Evan talk about that and how we plan on future-proofing our process and the steps that we've already taken to do that. All right, I'm going to do a few demos here. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the process of working with Mateus three years ago and coming on as our first accessibility specialist for the company. My priority at the time was making sure our content was accessible for everyone, uh, for students with disabilities. I previously worked in disability support, and I wanted to make sure everything worked for everyone. Um, one of the problems I encountered when I came on was primarily just a workflow one. As you probably understand now, a lot goes into this. There are a lot of points of failure, a lot of issues with uh, how the content may get placed in the end. And when it goes on the web, the content is just thrown into HTML and we may not have the expertise or the ability to QA that necessarily because we have expertise in a lot of other areas. Um, my first step in doing that was essentially decoupling the data from the, the content and making sure the content is well-formed, semantic, well-structured, all of the things that are essential for accessibility, but also just it's just good practice. Um, I think the first example I want to show you here is how we, oh, can you even see that? Um, how we turned our ebooks into Git repositories, basically static sites uh, that are generated into built into uh, EPUB, or we can build them into other things as well. But as part of that, we pulled things out of the book that we were setting manually in the book that is essentially data. And in this version of it, they're JSON files just to hold the data, but you can imagine them existing uh, at an API or something like that in an asset management system. But one of the things that Mateus mentioned was glosses, that's one of the early things that we pulled out of it, and those are being built essentially. They're being taken uh, from a data model and being built server-side. It's essentially doing server-side rendering, and this is something we would love to be able to do with all of those different types of annotations that Mateus mentioned and demonstrated, but doing it server-side and doing it on on build process is something that um, we would we would essentially need to be able to inject these things 
server side. Um, this process of building the ebook tools to manage them as Git repositories is essentially what f caused the formation of the lab. Um, and it's what led to the idea of innovating around annota annotations. Um, and the lab's first experiment a little, little over a year ago uh, was on annotations. So I'm gonna demo that right now. We, we came to iAnnotate last year and had a lot of ideas that came out of it. Um, the first idea that we had was to annotate for students, specifically the student experience of annotations because as you maybe picked up on with Carly's presentation and, and Mateus's, uh, the student experience of annotation is really important. It's what has essentially made us successful as a publisher. Um, we've been doing it in print for years, but replicating that in digital is really difficult. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening around social annotation, but while we were researching this, we realized that uh, most students do not annotate socially. Most people don't annotate socially. It's an antisocial process primarily. The things that you choose to to share with others or, or make public are, are the vast majority, minority of your, your annotations. Um, so our experiment on annotations was on antisocial annotations specifically. So I'll demonstrate that here. Um, we imagined a, a, a book, we published Norse mythology here, um, and I built a little ebook reader here a primitive one, just to help out with it. So here's a page that we've annotated with some mock annotations, essentially. And as the user's going through it, this is all pretty typical stuff. Um, let's make that a little bigger. We give the annotations quite a lot of space here and make them prevalent and easy to read and understand. Uh, you can click on the annotations to isolate the items. You can, of course, annotate your own. Um, and we were pretty clear, uh, during our research, we, it was pretty clear that there was no use case for ever just highlighting. You have to create content. Uh, so I can either write an annotation or I can add a tag. Uh, all right. But as part of the user experience of this, we wanted to really promote the tagging system and allow students to curate their own annotations in a meaningful way, uh, to filter them. Um, and a big part of that is how students review their annotations and how they aggregate them in a meaningful way. So we created another view for students' own particular notes where you can view all of your annotations, filter them. I can look for just Thor. Um, I can get rid of these tags. And then from here you can, I mean you can go back to the annotation in context. If you need to review it. But you can also select annotations that you want to use and add to an outline. Our imagination here was, uh, we imagined a world where a student was annotating and they were gonna write a paper and use their annotations as reference and as an outline essentially for their paper. Um, so you add them to the outline. I should say also, this is a prototype, a lot about this we will probably change <laughs> once we build a, a system like this. This is all basically just mocked information. The ebook's real, the annotations are ones that Mateus made <laughs> uh, to mock this. Um, and in this, this view, you can view them in different ways and reorder them. And we haven't built it yet, but the idea is that from this view, you'd be able to export your structured annotations. 
So maybe I order them in a certain way and create a, a few different buckets of annotations that are introduction, uh, exposition, different, different sections of my paper, and then I export them to a Word document or something like that. That was our first foray into, into annotations. Um, this conference has gotten me really thinking about annotations and uh, another tool that I created specifically for doing annotations of audio and video was the uh, transcript. So this is just a simple transcript module for creating transcripts and it's the one that Mateus showed. Um, the one he showed was an actual ebook. Here it is in just a dev environment to show how it works essentially. Um, it's pretty, I don't know if there's audio. If there were, you'd be able to, audio's playing through my computer. Um, but it's, it's tracking with the audio and you can go through it and it's all accessible, keyboard accessible, it uses web components to set the elements here. Uh, and it uses WebVTT um, to interpret the, the text and set the transcript. But another use case that came up when talking with Carly about this was audio. We publish uh, Chaucer, and if, show of hands, who, who had to memorize Canterbury Tales, prologue to the king? Oh, yeah. There you go, perfect. That's super common. Lots of students had, have to do it. I had to do it in my AP English class, I remember, in high school. Um, and we luckily have, I wish I could play the audio a little louder here. Let's see, can you guys hear? One that April with his surest sorter, the draught of March hath persed to the rota, and bathed every vine in switch liqueur of so this is really helpful for students when they're trying to memorize this and pronounce the Middle English uh, because it's, it's difficult to remember. But one of the problems we've had with this is when you have this long audio and you need to, like, oh, I need to hear that part. I need to just hear this line. And smaller foolies, Mark. And smaller foolies, Mark. And uh, it really helps to be able to click it and go straight there. These are essentially annotations of the content. Um, sort of cross-linking. I can show you the actual uh, web VTT here. Web VTT is, is, is essentially uh, annotation of audio or video content with timestamps. And I think that's it for the demos. If anybody has any questions about this stuff, feel free to ask. I want to start off with one question for the three of you. Um, we've been talking a lot today about lots of different ideas that people have or are imagining for annotation, and I wonder about how you, your process for moving from the imagining different use cases to actually collaborating with others, your, your users, and what that process is like. I know I had one little glimpse into a prototype, but I wonder how you're um, working with other instructors and maybe even students to do that work. Um, so I can talk a uh, a little bit about some of the user experience testing that we did after we published the first digital anthology ebook. Um, we wanted to kind of confirm that a lot of the assumptions we had made were working, that the ebook user experience was intuitive, and so that we could think about improvements to make for the next edition. Um, and there were two things that really came out of that um, user experience testing. I and mean, basically, I don't, many of you have probably done that kind of testing before, but I basically, in a WebEx environment, watched instructors and students use our ebook, saying very little, but kind of just saying, if you were preparing for class, you know, read this Anne Bradstreet poem as if you were preparing for class, and show me what you would do. How would you interact with the ebook? Um, and kind of talk through that um, while you're doing it. And it was interesting to see students, you know, these are English majors who have used print Norton anthologies before, going through and clicking on every tooltip annotation in that poem. And a few of them said, wow, these are so helpful. What are these things? And I said, well, these are, these are the footnotes that are in your Prince Norton anthology. So they said, oh, at the, at the bottom of the page, I don't look down there. And so having a, a digital tooltip annotation more accessible right there within the text actually improves the user experience, which is it's just a battle we often are, kind of a conversation we're having with
English professors a lot, they say, I don't want my students reading an ebook because they won't be as engaged, right? But in this situation, they were more engaged reading in the ebook um, and knowing more about the context. Um, another thing we discovered through that process was that our, our ebook readers' annotation tools for the student to actually make their own annotations was not sufficient. It wasn't as good as the print experience of annotating, uh, and that was a real barrier to digital adoption, and so that was one of the things I think that drove, I mean, that, I think that's why I'm on the digital annotation group, <laughs> because I was a pain about telling Evan and Mateus that, but um, yeah, you guys have anything? I'll add that we did do, in addition to that kind of testing, we did testing with, with the prototype that we showed here to find out what instructors are interested in and the different use cases for annotations. Um, the overwhelming <laughs> response has been that instructors really like the simplicity of the user interface and promoting the annotations. It's clear that annotations are a first class citizen in that interface. Um, and they like the fact that you can't highlight without any content creation that's critical for use cases. Um, another thing that was pretty apparent though that w is that it really does differ quite a bit. Michelle, you were one of the people we interviewed for that. Do you have anything to add about your take on our prototype? One of the things that I remember was um, when you were talking about like uh, the scansion annotations and the idea that some annotations are correct and incorrect and that struck me as odd um, just from my kind of literacy perspective and wanting to socially situate reading and writing and the meaning making processes. Um, but I hear a lot of that and so really thinking about how you adapt um, kind of the assessment that instructors might want for different purposes and the different ways that they might use annotation was really interesting to me. And I imagine it's really difficult to um, meet the needs of so many different users and, and the different pedagogies that, that are around the text. Uh, I'll also add that as part of the scoping process of working on that prototype that you saw, there were a lot more ideas that came out of it uh, that were never actually implemented. One of them, in talking about scansion, for example, uh, was changing the way that, for example, a student highlights and selecting different styles for those highlights. So a style might be something like an emoji or it might be a scansion mark. Uh, and if you're able to further customize and personalize the system for yourself and for the use case that you're um, interested in, then you could also make the annotation tool more flexible uh, for many different disciplines. Um, and part of that too is finding the right uh, way to store that information and that data. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we worked uh, with standards and a good uh, eye for design, both on the back end and on the front end. Uh, and because of those reasons, we wanted to uh, another aspect of collaboration is talking to people who are also interested in that problem. So we've talked to folks at Hypothesis, we've uh, talked to instructors, we've talked to uh, JSTOR, uh, and really try to identify common threads that uh, can, we can bring together and make a, a really a product that's viable for people working within Norton Text, but also out in the world, uh, with, uh, out in the web. We have a question here. Hi, um, Doug Shepard's Viz Studio. Uh, so first, I mean, you all know me anyway, but they don't. Um, I want to applaud first uh, your dedication to accessibility. Uh, this is uh, uh, a really important aspect of, of making sure that everybody has access to the information. And just as a plug, Evan and I are going to be at the Benetech Hackathon this weekend. Uh, working on making uh, our annotation clients accessible. Uh, so we're, we'll produce a best practice guide that will help all of you make your, your annotation engines accessible too. But the question I had uh, largely uh, was prompted by something Matthias said. Um, uh, with regards to standards, we did some stuff in the web annotation working group. Um, and you know, and certainly the data model is going to be useful in that sort of interoperability. But you you sort of mentioned that there were a bunch of tools out there that didn't interoperate, 
and I wonder if there's more to be done besides the data model. What more is there to be done in standards to make sure that things on the UX side or the best practice around accessibility or, or whatever, what other parts do you feel really need standardization um, so that we can have interoperable systems, not just from interchange, but up and down the board? I, I would say, I mean, putting my accessibility hat on, that's, that's a big piece, standardizing how you make annotations accessible is really important, and that's happening right now in the ARIA working group, um, which I'm on and helping with as much as possible. Um, as well as, I think, best practices for setting annotations. So there's a lot of talk about how we, uh, the data models for annotations and the back end implementations of annotations, but the front end piece is, it's really hard. And as you saw, we have lots of different front end implementations for our annotations that mean different things in the different contexts, whether the choice between presenting an annotation as a tooltip or as one of those cards, for instance, um, is an important one, and there needs to be a s maybe not a standard, but best practices for that, and those haven't really emerged yet, I would say. I think a lot of people are doing different things. Some of them are interesting. I think as we work on this more, best practices seem to be coalescing in some areas, but not all. Uh, I agree. It's a, or at least Norton's use case and other use cases that I've, I've talked to a few of you about, uh, it's really a matter about how, really authoring. Like, what is the experience, and what is the what are the interfaces that exist to make these annotations? And I was talking about the uh, editorial process in creating that markup that went into producing the digital annotations in the ebook. Um, if you can imagine a unified system that can be can serve the internal needs of a publisher that wants to create these annotation packages that are user friendly and then also have that same tool be the tool that the students, the, the customers are using uh, as they create their own notes and ingest, interpret, uh, learn from the Norton notes, then it can create more cohesion uh, across the entire uh, landscape and also create more connections between the producers of the content and the consumers of the content. And I think that that's still a, a question that's uh, unresolved. In the back? Oh, sorry. Devin, were you going to say? Well, I was just going to add that, that reminds me that I think one of our goals as a, an educational publisher is to create tools that help students learn how to annotate. <laughs> and I, we feel pretty strongly that we, uh, our, our business is annotation, essentially. Uh, a lot of our business model over the years has been annotation, and I think that was hopefully clear here. Um, and we want to sort of help students and instructors think about how we can create good annotation citizens of the world as students are learning to annotate in the classroom and maybe having a, a structured way of annotating there. Back here? Uh, I, that was loud. Um, I have a, one point of clarity and then uh, want to start a fight if I can. But uh, th this, can teachers see the students' individual private annotations, or do, do, do you ever think that they might be able to have a view into that activity? In the prototype, uh, our, our, our intention was no, they can't see them. So the student will have the choice to publish their own annotations to the group, to the class, to the instructor, to the world, to Hypothesis, to mm. wherever, whatever source. We would love to have it interoperate with every annotation source possible and allow the student to publish their annotations wherever they like. Okay. I'll just, oh, Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to add to that quickly. I mean, I think there's a, a place for social annotation when you're annotating a literary text, but I think you also have to provide that space for antisocial, a safe space for antisocial annotation. You know, a student, the things that I wrote in the margins of my Norton anthologies in college, I wouldn't want anyone to read. They're embarrassing, and I want to think about them before I put them in a paper. And um, I think that for a student to do real literary analysis, you have to put things up down there that are going to be just for yourself. And then, you know, maybe you can select ones that you would want to share with the rest of the class or with your instructor or with the world uh, later. 
Yeah, that's great. That's sort of where I wanted to start trying to start a fight was about this idea of like private annotation versus social annotation and actually maybe try to just get other people to fight inside of me in terms of Michelle with your research uh, or I know there's some other education researchers in the room who are looking specifically at, and again, I don't think it's an either or. Your answer, you kind of already diffused the fight by saying that there's a role for private annotation and a role for social annotation and a whole spectrum. But um, I just wanted to maybe talk more about um, the, you know, you, you've proven the case that the private annotation is incredibly useful for students, right? So what, let's prove the case that the social annotation, like why, why is that important? I know Michelle, something Michelle has thought about and, and others in the room that are from the learning sciences. As an instructor, um, I found being able to read my students' social annotations really helpful in planning for class. Um, so if they annotate before class, then I can read some of their thoughts and their thinking and see the patterns in the class, then I can bring that into the discussion. Um, and it's, it serves for formative assessment. Um, I haven't had a whole lot of luck yet with my undergraduate students in getting them to really engage in truly social annotation. Um, I found them kind of tending to do uh, more of like an echo chamber of very similar annotations without actually kind of collaborating in a discussion. Um, and so I have some thoughts about things I need to change when I'm working with undergraduate students to help them you know, really participate in the social aspects of annotation and keep in mind the audience um, of, of the social annotations and who they're writing for and how to transform the kinds of annotations they make privately into um, publicly useful um, texts. Um, I was very surprised to hear that there, that your research showed that there wasn't a use case for highlights that were not tied to annotations. Uh, I know that from my experience and how I learned to, to read, um, there seems to be very clear uses, or at least, I mean, I mean maybe, maybe that's changed you know, in the past 20, 30 years since I was in school. Um, but I was wondering how much of that I mean, you're, it also seems that maybe there's a sort of didactic purpose because of the type of material that you're dealing with that um, you don't, that there may be a use case, but you don't want that use case to actually happen. So I, maybe you could just clarify what your research showed or why that decision was made. It, it kind of goes to this idea of scaffolding and our, you're, you're absolutely right that we recognize it as a use case, <laughs> and it's one that we just don't want to encourage because our audience for annotation is uh, maybe the undergrad students who don't know how, how to annotate very well yet, they aren't comfortable with it, uh, maybe they will tend to annotate in a specific way that isn't necessarily all that helpful for learning. Um, we want to scaffold for them and help them learn how to annotate, and highlighting especially for younger students, people who haven't really annotated much, um, they tend to highlight something that they think is meaningful and then you come back to it later and you think, what, what does this, what's this highlight for? I, you don't remember what it is. Um, there def there's definitely a use case for it. It's a choice though, yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that, that's exactly what I was going to say is that we haven't really prevented standalone highlights. It's just if you do highlight, then you have to at least add a tag to it so that you remember what that highlight corresponds to. And that, uh, that also lets you then collect your thoughts later by filtering through those tags. Uh, but I do understand the, the issue of, uh, and I had a similar experience as a student, is um, highlighting as you're reading as a method of kind of pinning that thought down. Uh, and, in kind of a spatial manner, uh, so that like if you're doing an exam or writing an essay later, you remember, oh, I know the answer to this question because I remember the moment in which I highlighted that phrase in my book. Um, and I think that's very valuable too. Um, what you could do in a tool like this is really create a, a generalized tag and then just apply that to everything you wanted to highlight. Question okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question. So. Um, uh, when you showed all, all those annotation um, software for, for like videos and audio, I think that that was really uh, impressive and really interesting use case. So I'm curious as to like, uh, uh, does like Norton have any plans to perhaps like, I don't know, open source this software or maybe like work with developers in terms of like making an API? Because it seems like that's a really big like potential for working with the community. 
I, I would love to open source it. <laughs> we don't have a model for that currently. Um, we are a for-profit company and we just don't have a model for it. It's, I built it in a way that would be very easy to open source. It has clear APIs, it works with uh, WebVTT if your browser supports that and um, has instructions for how to use Mozilla's WebVTT <laughs> polyfill as well. Um, and it's a web component as well. I'm, I may change that at some point. That was just for fun. I, I would also say that we are a 95 year old publisher that only in the last three years have started thinking about these kinds of questions. And I think that's a very common issue across publishing uh, as a whole, is that there's not quite a culture established yet uh, for open sourcing uh, code or, or solutions, um, but that there is certainly a uh, an upward trend in that, and publishers are more willing to share. <laughs> we have time for one last question here in the front. Yeah, I'd like to come back to the um, aspect of private versus social uh, annotations. I think both are really important and necessary, and I think it's also uh, a way for the students to decide how they want to work with that. Uh, we have developed Annotation Studio, which we have been using for a long time, and you know, initially also some of the, our uh, instructors asked, could we just put in the Norton texts into <laughs> Annotation Studio? We prevented them from doing that, but, <laughs> but now you're building that. But what uh, is interesting for the students, they go through a process. And quite often they start out with, with uh, an individual a private annotation. Uh, sometimes even turning off uh, the other students' annotations so that they don't, don't get distracted. Other students really want to see other people's annotations. And I think that's one way of thinking about a, about a process and uh, because you mentioned you want to teach them how to annotate properly. And I think that's one way of teaching them to also work with the others and get inspired. How could I actually annotate? Because you know, some, some students think, well, my thoughts are really not relevant in that case. But then when they see that someone else is annotating something very similar, they say, OK, I have actually something to, con to contribute. And we have had many uh, uh, responses from, in from instructors, especially on the high school level, uh, where they said, you know, students who never speak up in class, they annotate. And they annotate because it's a social annotation. Lest any of you think that Michelle got short shrift for moderating the session, she's going to be speaking tomorrow, so her time will come. Round of applause for our...